Is the start of the school year overwhelming for you? Well, join the club. It's a common experience. As exciting as it is to start fresh each fall, we all need a little help getting organized. Today's guest, Margaret Gallopo, is here to share some tips on organizing the schoolroom and the school year. Stay with us. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Maladnik. Today we're talking with Margaret Gallopo about organizing the schoolroom and the school year. Margaret Gallopo and her husband, Brian, recently celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary. Yay! They have eight children ranging from 7 to 26. A special education teacher by training, Margaret earned undergraduate and graduate degrees from Nazareth College and holds two teaching certifications. She left the classroom when her eldest was born. Soon after, the Gallopos began their homeschool journey. They are still homeschooling over 20 years later, and they still love it. Margaret has not returned to the traditional classroom, but has continued to teach, not only in her homeschool, but as a private tutor and in small group settings like co-ops. She teaches online classes for both students and parents with Mother of Divine Grace School, where she also works as a special services consultant. Margaret and her husband Brian were also coaches for Lego League and taught baptism classes for a number of years when they lived in Florida. But the Gallopos recently moved to Long Island, New York, and have been thrilled to find a wonderful Catholic homeschool community here. Although meeting people in a pandemic has been challenging, Margaret says, with God, all things are possible. Amen. You can find Margaret at her blog, FindingJoyOnTheJourney.com. Welcome to the program, Margaret. Thanks, Lisa. I'm happy to be with you. Oh, we really need this topic. Some people have a gift for organization and some don't, but when we look at different people's systems, sometimes we'll pick up one little tidbit that helps us to improve or, or a whole system that cha- is a game changer for us. And you've really simplified things in a nice way. Start us off with some of the basic ideas that you base your system on. Thanks. Well, I've kind of come up with an acronym, and it spells out HOME, H-O-M-E, and that would be organizing when you think about compartmentalizing that, sort of putting it in bins, that H would stand for the hours. How are you going to organize your time, which is really just as important as your stuff? (laughs) And then uh, thinking about objectives or goals, kind of why we're doing this and how we're going to go about it in the big picture sense. And then the M would st- stand for your materials, all that stuff that we have, the, the pencils and the pens and the books that we need and, and the syllabi and so forth. And then the E would be for setting up the physical environment, right? So the space that you're going to homeschool in, some people use a schoolroom and some people just have, have a corner where they're going to organize their stuff and that's fine. Or maybe it's a multi-purpose room, a dining room that serves as both. But it's, it's, it's important to decide where that will be or how that will be. I mean, at least I think for me, it's helpful to have that. And I've always enjoyed having a schoolroom, a dedicated space. So if you have the room to do that, even if it's a convertible space, I think that's helpful. Mm, right. Great. I love that because when you have the, an acronym like that, you can kind of run through it in your mind and everyone will see that and hear it in a different way. But that's kind of part of the genius of being a human being who calls on the Holy Spirit, right? So take us through some steps. Where would you begin, Margaret? So if you're brand new um, to homeschooling, you might start with the O and thinking about your objectives or your goals overall. What, what do you want to accomplish? Hopefully, because you're listening to this podcast, you're thinking about homeschooling in the sense of providing a Catholic homeschooling experience, which is quite unique and special. It really is. And, and it isn't until you really get into homeschooling in, in a Catholic kind of way that, that you realize that it is different. So I think thinking about your goals and objectives, how do you provide uh, an education that's truly Catholic, incorporating the good, the true, the beautiful, integrating the faith across the curriculum where it makes sense when you study history, incorporating saints and so forth, you know, really 
bringing it alive in that way and living the liturgical year as a family. That's why I think of homeschooling as a lifestyle because it really it really doesn't start and end at a particular moment. So, so I think as far as objectives, having that idea of, um, you know, what, what is our purpose? And because you're new to homeschooling, some people are this year. I think um, maybe for those who are new, you might like to just have a general sense because this will refine over time as you uh, develop a philosophy and a sense of what you want and a better feel for how your kids work in different areas. That, that will become refined. So I think that just I want that Catholic liturgical lifestyle for my family. I want to have provide a, a solid Catholic education, incorporating the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I want to meet the homeschool laws of my state. So I want to know, be familiar with what they are and be sure that I cover the subjects that that, that would require in, in those things. So in terms of the, those kind of goals and objectives, and as you move along too, you may think about objectives for each child, and that can include not only academic, but virtue. And, um, you know, how can we look at, at those areas? And, and uh, so don't feel overwhelmed by it but, it, but it is a good place to start in your thinking. And it will direct you also toward a type of curriculum, probably, as you look, whether you're going to put your own together, which some people do, and it's certainly a great option. But if you choose a particular curriculum, you'll probably gravitate toward one that kind of makes sense to you and your overall goals and objectives. And each curriculum, whatever provider you choose, or if you do your own, you're going to fit within the, the ideas, the goals that you have there. So, and, and that, that curriculum provider will provide a, a specific list too to help you. Right. Yeah. And that's such, these are such important questions to ask ourselves. What lifestyle? What virtues? What individual goals? What family goals? What kind of homeschooling will we do? And I love that you work with Mother Divine Grace because we shifted from one curriculum over to Mother Divine Grace when we first started because my daughter was a more artsy kid than the program we were in. And we started doing poetry and creative writing and reading wonderful historical novels to get a grounding in time periods. And that was a game changer for us. If finding that right fit and, and the way we did that was not by shopping online. We were talking to other families and looking at what they were doing. And that really helped too. So if, if listeners have an opportunity to go to any mom gatherings or get people on the phone or do some Zooms or whatever, it is. Find out what they're doing for their kids that maybe have similar temperaments to yours. That's, that's so true, Lisa. Seeing what other people are doing and hearing their story, it, it's really helpful. But Mother of Divine Grace has been a wonderful fit for our family for many, many years now. And, I, and like you said, it really um, brings history alive, allows the integration of history with the saints. And it is creative. And when Laura wrote her book, Designed, Laura Burke was the wonderful founder of Mother Divine Grace. When she wrote her book, she, Designing Your Own Classical Curriculum, she really had making it work for your family in mind. And um, we, we still hold true to that. And that's why we have consultants, so that they can guide you in that, in that journey. Yeah, just so much richness there and so much fun, too. Yes, it is fun. <laughs> we love it. It's still fun. Yeah. And it should be fun. Yeah, you should really. It's such um, a joy and a gift to have this time with our kids. And, um, and it goes fast. <laughs> yeah, so, there's a good goal yeah. for you. So what's yes. next? How do we put the next piece together? So then the, then the, uh, the H um, that with your hours, I think you want to sit down and say, what is important for us? Um, as a family, are you into music or is it robotics? Is that that what makes your family tick? Like what kinds of activities do you really thrive on as a family? Do you enjoy the outdoors or is it sports? But you, you know, those activities that happen on a regular basis, you want to get out a planner, you want to get a good planner and, and put those down, block those out. For our family, it's music. My kids have always played multiple instruments and in arts and they're very interested. So, you know, and they have lessons, right? So you need to schedule that time into you. So that's sort of an anchor thing and you block those things in as you're starting. And then are they taking any classes online. Mother Divine Grace has learning support classes. There are the classes available. Are they in a co-op or a support group? So just kind of start there. Block in those times 
And then as you get that filled out, you look at, you know, is this a reasonable amount? I think before COVID, um, a lot of people had their planners pretty full. <laughs> pretty full. So, um, so yeah. we, you know, sometimes reassessing is it, or is it a little too full, you know, and then, but, and then looking at the blocks that are still open and determining the best way to fill those blocks, um, what makes sense. And, uh, you know, you, you need time to prepare dinner in some way or some fashion or whatever. Um, although kids can help with that, but, but, uh, the, the windows that are left, that's where your school comes and you need to make sure you have enough windows for school, of course. And then how will you use those? Do you want to go do subjects in particular order with particular children? I always look at which subjects I'm going to do that are most mom intensive because some of the things kids can do independently that, you know, if they're doing some independent reading during the day or practicing their instrument, there's some things on their list that they can accomplish pretty independently. But you want to look at what are the mom things? What are the things that are mom directed? And I need to put time in my on the schedule that I'm going to have time to to rotate through and work with the kids on those things. Sometimes combining kids can be a way to help. Maybe they do art together this year. So there's ways to, to help with the time. But really get looking at those hours, again, is just like the goals. It's an important step in making it work. And also remember to be flexible, especially if you're new. But every year is different, right? It was always things, everything is changing. So you have to be flexible about it. Don't be rigid, but definitely having a plan laid out will really help make things smoother. Yeah, and Margaret, I just want to note that when I first started out, I overplanned like, yeah. <laughs> and it's not that I never did it again. It seems like it was my autumn madness. I yes. would be so inspired to start the new year that I would cram our schedule too full. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one year, my daughter felt like she was failing, and I went, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! We need to regroup," you know, because we just we both got so excited picking out courses and opportunities that we really overdid it, and and so we had to regroup. And I had to explain to her, "No, that was." a mom error that was, that was not you um, we're going to dial it back now and just you know, drop some things create some space for us to have quality of life and and not be all stressed out all the time and so that took a little bit of sorting through it's really a tendency for me I think it's almost like greedy wanting to grab every possible experience for my child and then completely you know causing a meltdown it's such a temptation. I, I've done that too. I've done that too. Um, yeah, we. I think we. I think we. Um, if if we're planners, we tend to overplan. So, <laughs> leave some breathing room for life to happen, for there to be surprises, all of that. Right? Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Margaret. Yes. And uh, I did want to mention that I do um, like uh, to use a, a Catholic planner. Um, that is, it's. Um, the Good News Planner, and it is color coded. It has the liturgical year. It has nice bright boxes um, for subjects, and I like to do that. Use that for myself, um, and the the kids can color in as they go. Now, if you're with a program like Mother Divine Grace, they also have wonderful printable lists that you can print out. Um, sometimes for the littlest kids, though, still that's more detail than they need, and and so sometimes just being able to color in a box that says "see list." reading or something like that can be can be helpful and I do put their lists on color-coded clipboards so they can at a quick glance grab their clipboard that has their list and and go from there and I also like a resource a website called cozy.com and that is really neat because it allows me to put in um, birthdays I can do meal planning but as in addition to that I will set up all those anchor things that I said were on the schedule, like the music lessons, and I will put them in and they come out on the schedule every week. It generates that for me, as well as I can add as many reminders as I want. I can have a reminder a week ahead, a day ahead, an hour ahead. And I send the reminders not only to myself, but to the child who's in the activity. They get an email reminder as well. And so Cozy has that set up for me. So that's a really big help for me. Um, to remember the things and keep keep it going. But I like the reminders. I can print that out or I also have it on my phone. 
So Boy, that that's a nice great. resource. Cozy.com. We're going to put that in the show notes along with the link for the Good News School Planners. Yeah, and I'll put it on my blog too. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, don't forget everybody to check out findingjoyonthejourney.com. Okay, so what's the next piece of information we need to get this pulled together? So other than the, the hours and the objectives, and then we have... Um, and then we have the materials, right? And that was what we were talking about, your books. I like to separate them by student as much as possible. Now, if you're in a literature-based program like Mother Divine Grace, there are many wonderful, wonderful books that you will read. And they don't all need to be in the child's cubby because they're not going to be used constantly. But for those books like your math book, your science book that you are going to use on a regular basis, on a daily basis, um, I like to have a cubby. I have a set of shelves from Ikea that is like they actually have a door in front of them. So um, and that and those shelves, I have one for each of us, the kids and myself. And that cubby for myself, I have my teacher materials in there, the, any teacher books that I need. And then for each child, their books are all organized right there. The cubby closes, it's neat, it's there. But you can use bins, you could use bookshelves, whatever. But for each child to have an organized space for their materials. Um, And then the other things that you want to think about, you know, will you need some art materials? Probably. It's a great thing to have. And and if you can organize those together, we're going to have a bin of crayons, a bin of markers. Here's colored paper that kind of thing. Um, Play-Doh, you know, start simple and build over the years, right? So uh, those kinds of things. A a copier is a great thing to have. You use that often, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. uh, A way to to play audiobooks or music. So uh, think about a listening station. Now that's become so easy with all the Alexa devices, but um, always had an area for listening. Um, And then different flexible space to... And that's going to come into the environment, which is the last space. So your materials, um, you know, being those things that you will use, and then your physical space, your environment. And so you want to think about how are you going to set up the room physically? Where will the art supplies go? Where will the books and, and such go that you've gathered together and purchased and and so forth. So where will you place them? And then do you want desks or do you want a big table? Do you want a few tables? For some kids that need to move, do you want an exercise ball for a chair? Is that a good chair? We have a lot of the big floor pillows, too, so kids can move. I mean, maybe they don't want to be in the desk all day long, you know? So how do you create opportunities for them to move around a little bit throughout the day in the space as well? That's a really nice thought because I remember... As I said, we sort of tried to recreate school at first, and we were really overdoing the table time. But one thing we did do was periodically we would turn on some music and dance, or we'd go for a walk. Right. Like it was our physical education at that point in that first quarter of our first year homeschooling. We had pulled her out after the fourth grade. I didn't know what I was doing. All I knew is that it was going to kill us both if we sat at a table all day. And so we gradually evolved to her, you know, reading Tolstoy on the couch or in her bedroom or in the backyard or whatever it was. So that homeschooling environment did shift and kind of morph into something that was more friendly to my child over time. But this piece of really thinking it through, what do you really want? And then doing your best to kind of design that with some flexibility for the sake of the kids is just so smart. Yeah, and I think that you're right about it morphing, and it will move throughout the house. That's a natural thing when the kids want to read and they want to go be cozy on the couch or find a quiet spot or maybe go out to the gazebo in the yard or on a chair outside. So that's a really kind of good and natural thing. But I still think that even even if you don't have a dedicated room, having a dedicated space where things are stored and organized and where you, you can gather together, even if it's for a short time every day, to do something together, whether it's a prayer or whatever. So I think that that having having that centralized location, and I know for myself with moving across the country last year and being in bins as we traveled and, and through the stages of the move, and then finally when I had my homeschool room t- together, it was just such a sense of peace and awe. And then with the crazy of the COVID, you know, it just 
you know, said to my husband, I said, you know, I don't know all the crazy that will happen this year, but I know this piece makes sense. You know, there's an order here and, and it's a flexible order, as you said, and it should be, we should be enjoying and, and, and feeling comfortable where we are. But um, also that sense of order, God gave us an ordered world. That sense of order really is a good thing. Mm, it's, it's so liberating too. And like you have artistic kids who are musical, whether they're artistic or not, having a framework can be very liberating. If, if expectations are clear, the family is less stressed. And if there is that, what you were saying, that flexibility, we don't know, someone might get sick or maybe this week is, maybe, maybe this is your tech week for the, for the homeschool play or whatever and everything kind of goes out the window. But um, that's part of the the beauty of homeschooling is that we can adapt to those things and embrace opportunities. Uh, And sometimes it just means giving everybody a break. But with the framework, we have that peace of mind, don't we? Absolutely. Such a good point. Yeah, absolutely. It really it really is true. And and I think, too, that when those things happen, those disruptions that will happen in life, that absolutely will happen. So plan for that. But when they happen, it's so nice with homeschooling because you take the time that you need, but you can also know that you're on the next page when you go back. You know, it's not like you're trying to figure out what the teacher did or how to, how to catch up or there's, you just keep moving forward, you know? And so I think that's a really nice thing too. And for those families that are just starting, they might like to try just building their schedule over the first few weeks of school. Maybe you don't add in science and history and everything in week one. Maybe you get used to doing the math and the language arts and the religion and just build for a couple of weeks in the beginning as you get used to it. You know, the first few weeks as mom is getting used to a new curriculum and new books as well, there's a little bit of a learning curve. So it will take a little bit longer for people to figure, well, what am I supposed to do with this assignment? And and as they get more familiar with a book, you know, or a lesson, it, oh, yes, I, you know, I know how to do. So, it, so it, it, it's more productive as you go along, too, I think, in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. And little things, too, that you discover along the way, which is that some subjects at home, if you're coming from a regular school, and homeschooling for the first time, some things are going to go a lot faster than you realize. The kids will get things done in a much quicker time because it's not a teacher with a big classroom full of kids. It's you one-on-one with your child or with a few children taking them through something. You end up having more time than you expect for in, in some ways. In other ways, as Margaret was saying, it is a learning curve, but you get more comfortable as you go. Unless your children are already in high school, most of the work is not going to be as challenging for you as it is for them you'll be able to deal and as margaret has also referred to there are online classes and tutors and co-ops and things that can help you with the things that you're not 100 percent comfortable teaching but um really finding that that place of peace with your family being rhythm with your kids most of them i've heard this story again and again people who temporarily homeschool their kids go back to school and they're way ahead of everybody else because time shifts. The child gets into their own learning rhythm. They tend to thrive in that one-on-one situation. And so just just to note that as you're organizing your time, be be sensitive to the fact that the Holy Spirit is working, that you've been invited into this moment, and God is teaching the whole family to get into a rhythm with Him as well. But having that framework is just such a blessing to the family. Yeah, and I think with COVID too, we we've you know we've all struggled, but I think seeing that slowing down is okay sometimes, and there can be fruit from that as well. And as far as doing like a lot of different things, I've always kind of thought of myself as a general contractor. You know, I d- I don't try to teach harp lessons or advanced Latin. <laughs> um, you know, I I I know my limitations, and I definitely have them. But there are so many resources and such amazing people um, that God has put in our lives. So so you can find those. And again, that's part of the hours piece, right? Where you're plotting in those plotting those people and those resources into the schedule because there are going to be an important way to get where you want to (laughs) go. 
Right. What are some just final takeaways, Margaret, for this idea of preparing the homeschool and kind of looking forward to the year and, and getting ourselves ready? I think I would say to enjoy your children and to remember that it will never go as you plan. That planning is so wonderful, but it will never go as you plan. So enjoy the journey and know that whatever you do, that that's what, you know, you're doing what God is calling you to do and, and that there will be wonderful fruit from that. So, so enjoy the journey, you know, plan it as best you can, but know that nothing ever goes exactly according to plan and God has a plan. And I, you know, wish you all who are listening the best, um, the best in your school year that you'll have much joy. Thank you so much, Margaret. And for those of you who are, you know, by the time this airs, you're already into your, the beginning of your school year, you can always stop and reassess. Um, stay flexible with yourself. Periodically, maybe schedule a date with your husband uh, to just talk about how things are going and make whatever adjustments are needed. Stay flexible, trust God. And uh, Margaret, thank you so much. Really appreciate all of the specifics, the great ideas, and also the acronym. And everybody, remember to find Margaret at her blog, findingjoyonthejourney.com. And again, we have links for cozy.com, the planner, and anything else we think of, we'll throw in there too. Uh, again, thanks, Margaret. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. God bless. God bless you too. All right, everybody, stay tuned for our short feature coming right up. Hello, my homeschooling friend, and welcome to the Homeschool Housefly. I'm Celeste Behe, and I've been homeschooling for 30 years. My associate on this podcast segment is Frankie the Housefly, who for those 30 years has been literally a fly on the wall watching my family's homeschool adventure as it unfolded. Frankie and I want to know, what is your biggest homeschooling challenge? If you're like many homeschoolers, it's a nagging sense of self-doubt, a feeling that you just don't measure up to the other homeschooling moms. How can you quash self-doubt? Here are three small steps you can take. Number one, acknowledge your successes. Keep a running list of your homeschooling accomplishments. Did you organize the bookshelf? Or teach Johnny that a verb isn't a noun? Or find the calculator in fewer than 15 minutes? Yeah, that counts. Write it on the list and post the list where you'll see it every day. On the lesson planner, on the fridge door, on the wine decanter, anywhere that you won't miss it. Number two, practice mentorship. Even if you're a relatively new homeschooler, you can mentor less experienced homeschoolers. You don't need to know everything before you can offer something. By sharing what you do know, you'll be gaining confidence in your own abilities and knowledge. You know more than you think you know. I believe that, and so should you. Number three, engage socially. Frankie says that I used to avoid the homeschool moms get-togethers because, unlike me, those amazing moms baked bread for their families and went to nighttime adoration and did homework correction without the teacher manual. If only I'd listened to Mother Angelica, who said, let us not be confused by the talents of other saints, but be the kind of saints we were created to be. Be your own kind of saint, and when you meet someone whose gifts are different from yours, resolve to feel inspired instead of inferior. Whatever your reasons for homeschooling, they probably haven't changed since the day you forsook that big yellow school bus. Keep those reasons in mind, and don't let self-doubt get in the way on your own homeschooling journey. The best thing you can do for your children is to move forward. I'm Celeste Behe, and with a little help from Frankie, this has been The Homeschool Housefly. 
That's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com, where you can get online courses for your grade school, middle school, and high school student. Learn from the experts and make your homeschooling easier. Be sure to leave a review and share this podcast with your friends. And we'll see you next time here on the Homeschooling Saints podcast.